Hi, I'm Sebastian Ies van der Necker. I run the Plant Parasite Interactions Lab at the uh, Department of Plant Sciences, University of Cambridge. Welcome to this Science on Sunday seminar series. Um, if you're a regular of the series, um, then, then welcome back. Uh, if you're new to this series, then welcome. Uh, the idea of this series is to try to give uh, kind of an informal opportunity for us to share um, uh, some of the work that we do, some of the challenges we're trying to overcome, and how we fit that into the, the bigger picture. Now, I was scheduled to give this talk um, in July 2020, and obviously because of the, uh, the global pandemic, that's just not going to happen. So I'm recording this from my from my home, and I'm going to try and be as faithful as possible to the seminar series. So this is not going to be polished audio or polished video or anything like that. I'm just going to try and give uh, the same talk that I would have given in person um, as, as best as possible. So the title of this talk is The Overlooked Enemy. Uh, nematode worms eating the plants from under our feet and I'll kind of explain that as we go along but maybe you can already tell from this title that I'm kind of interested in um, things that eat plants, things that attack plants uh, and plant health. Now plant health is um, tremendously important, um, as important if not more important than animal health um, because of course you know if, if, uh, if you haven't got anything to eat it doesn't it doesn't really matter if you get sick um, but it's something that's often overlooked um, and so because of that, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has decreed that 2020 is the International Year of Plant Health. And so this is really um, a global initiative to try to raise awareness of um, the importance of plant health uh, and the benefits of preserving plant health um, for global food security, um, for addressing uh, poverty, biosecurity, uh, improving, um, um, you know, economic impact and, and, and things like that. So uh, a tremendous um, initiative, a fantastic time uh, to work in the area of plant health, and a fantastic time to discover an interest um, in plant health. Now, there are many different um, kinds of plant diseases and plant pathogens. Indeed, there are too many for any one person to work on. And so we work on a, a particular kind of um, a disease. You know, we, we have our favorite disease, if you like, if you want to say it like that, uh, and that is these plant parasitic nematode worms. Now, I'll go into a bit more detail um, in a couple of slides about what is a plant parasitic nematode, but I thought, first of all, I would start by um, just introduction into what are nematodes. So nematodes are typically these microscopic worm-like creatures, and here you can see a video of a couple of nematodes from the lab. Uh, under a microscope, this kind of classic representation that you, of what you would imagine is a nematode worm um, uh, crawling along under the microscope. Although it's worth pointing out that nematodes have this huge diversity of um, body shapes and sizes, both within and between species that we'll see later. Um, but generally, this is kind of what nematodes are, these kind of microscopic worms. Uh, they are everywhere. Um, so uh, a much loved quote um, by Nathan A. Cobb is that if you were to remove all of the matter on the planet, um, except nematodes, so you removed everything, but you left the nematodes there, then you would still be able to faintly recognize the hills and the valleys, uh, the rivers, the riverbeds and the fields, um, etc. Um, simply um, by the nematodes that used to used to live there. Uh, and even he goes on to say that you would be able to recognize individual species um, by the nematodes uh, that had specialized to live in them or on them. Uh, so really, really everywhere. So I like that quote. It kind of, you know, uh, paints this nice picture for me at least of, of how um, uh, of how ubiquitous nematodes are on the planet. Um, and, you know, they're incredibly numerous. So um, if you kind of count all animals together, each individual animal together, then nematodes are by far the most abundant. So more than half of all animals on the planet are nematodes. And so if you really had to generalize and you said, okay, what is an animal? Then an animal is a nematode. Uh, you wouldn't be wrong uh, uh, to make that generalization. So really everywhere. Um, and so um, to bring this closer to home, if you were to go into your garden uh, and you dug up a cup of soil, there would be thousands, I mean, literally thousands of nematodes in that single cup. Now I know this to be true um, because I've done it. So here is the, the back lawn of Kings. Um, if you follow Cambridge News, you may know that we've been preparing this for a wild flower meadow, as you can see here. Um, and as part of that, we thought it'd be a nice idea to look at nematode diversity before and after um, uh, the introduction of this wild flower meadow. And so we've um, been collecting soil from, from, from the back. Uh, and, and these are some of the nematodes that we collected. Um, and you can see this, um, you know, 
there's hundreds and there's this great diversity in sizes and shapes and speeds, um, etc. Now, most nematodes are not bad guys, right? And I don't want to, to slander all nematodes when I say that. Most of them are good guys. Um, they're very important parts of um, many ecosystems. Uh, they eat you know, a diversity of things that can eat bacteria or fungi or, or, or um, other nematodes, in fact, and really only a minority um, are the plant parasites. But um, despite that, they're very heavily um, studied, and that's because the impact they have on food security is so tremendously high um, that it kind of justifies this intense study. So that's what we work on, plant parasitic nematodes. Um, and so to give a bit of a name to a plant parasitic nematode, here you've got my number one favorite picture of a plant parasitic nematode. Here's a root um, going from uh, left to right across the bottom of the screen. And on the side of the root, you can see what looks like this kind of small gray lemon shaped creature. That's the nematode. Now this doesn't look much like the kind of nematodes I showed you before. And that's because this one has been feeding on the, on the, on, on the plant. It's very happy and it's got nice and fat. Um, but what happens in this interaction is a kind of a, a worm shaped nematode um, will invade the root it'll move to the center of the root and then here it'll choose a single plant cell and it will convince that plant cell to start dividing and that plant cell will divide and and and, and ultimately form this uh, very elaborate um, a structure inside the root um, that we call a feeding site. That structure will swell up uh, inside the root. It's been stained here in orange and you can see how it's kind of swollen and the, and the, and the roots are kind of stretched, uh, uh, the other cells of the root are kind of stretched around it to try to contain it. Now tumor is absolutely the wrong word for this structure. It's not a tumor, um, but it has the right kind of connotations, I think, at least in my mind, um, about what this structure is. So the nematode will make the plant make this feeding site uh, and then it will slowly eat it. Um, and this is, um, uh, the way it eats it is in a, a non-destructive manner. So this is not a uh, herbivore, this is a biotroph. And so this is um, an animal that will le eat living tissue. And so it will slowly withdraw nutrition from this feeding site every sort of uh, six hours or so for a period of up to several weeks uh, in this non-destructive manner. And if at any time um, this single feeding cell dies, uh, the nematode dies. It can't move and go and make another one. The fate of the feeding site and the nematode are absolutely linked. And uh, the reverse is true. Uh, if the nematode dies, then the feeding site will wither away and die as well. And what I like about that is it tells you that this communication between these two kingdoms of life uh, is kind of actively maintained during this process and that neither of these would exist without the other. Um, so this profound dependency um, on its host for survival. What I also find amazing about this is uh, these types of nematodes are born um, juvenile, so they're born without a gender. Uh, once they infect the root, um, then their gender is determined by how good of a parasite they are. So if you're a good parasite, you make a big feeding site, you get lots of nutrition, then you'll develop into a female. So females are necessarily successful. And if you're um, uh, kind of a, a bad parasite, you develop a small feeding site or it develops in a part of the root that doesn't give you enough nutrition, and then you'll develop into a male. So males are unsuccessful, individuals in this case. And I think that's amazing. You know, it kind of makes sense um, if you think about it, because um, to be a female is energetically very demanding. You've got to make eggs uh, and this is a huge investment. And so you need to be able to rely on, rely on your host and have a good um, uh, energy source to do that. Whereas if you're a male and you, you realize things are not going great, you know, your feeding site isn't forming well, you think I'm not going to be able to support eggs. So I'm going to become a male. I'm going to go and find a mate and I'm going to rely on her being successful um, to pass on my genes to the next generation. So I think that's amazing. Um, you know, sec this kind of um, gender determination by um, uh, by food availability is incredibly rare um, in in nature in general, and when it's linked to this parasitic ability, I think it's just amazing. Now, not only is this um, uh, cool, it's also important. So these um, kinds of nematodes have a worldwide distribution. Uh, there's at least one species for every major food crop of the world. And so that includes all of the ones um, in this picture, but any crop you can think of, uh, there's a nematode that eats it. Uh, and together they cost um, well over a hundred billion dollars a year um, in global crop losses. Now, that's a, a, a large number and that's a combined cost from both the direct losses of the nematode. So the, you know, the effect that it has directly on the plant and by withdrawing nutrition and making the plant smaller, for example, and giving less um, 
uh, less crop or yet less lower yield, um, but also the combined cost of that plus the cost of, of, of farmers trying to control them, whether that be with rotations or with interventions or with um, uh, chemical applications. Um, and so a huge cost globally. Now, if they cost so much globally, why are they overlooked or why do I say they're overlooked? Um, and for two reasons. One, I mean, they're literally overlooked. So these things are soil um, uh, dwelling organisms and they parasitize roots. Uh, and that causes a bit of a problem because you can imagine if you're a farmer and you're looking across a field and you see some sick plants, uh, if the disease um, you know, symptom is on the leaves, you can just like look at the leaf and you can see the disease. And so it's very easy to attribute that disease um, uh, to this, this phenotype or this, this, um, this damaged crop. But when the, uh, the disease is below ground, uh, you can't easily see it. And so it's much more difficult to say, okay, this sick plant is because it has a nematode infection. Um, and so it's very often difficult um, to make that link. And in fact, um, that link is still challenging to make um, uh, uh, today. The second problem um, is that because these nematodes parasitize the roots and because they change the root physiology and, and, and damage the roots, then they can tend to exacerbate or amplify other problems. Uh, so for example, um, if, you, if you damage the roots of a plant, it's gonna to struggle to take up water. And so therefore, um, when you have uh, drought stress or some kind of stress like that, um, then the ones that have been nematode infected, this kind of, kind of, kind of, gonna kind of amplify um, that drought stress. And again, so that's kind of a non-specific symptom that would normally be attributed to a very severe drought, but actually it could be a combination of, of factors. Um, and, and the contribution of nematodes to that is, is often overlooked. So what do we do uh, in the lab? So we try to understand um, uh, enough about how this works. So how does this communication between nematode, animal, uh, and this plant cell, how does that communication work? Um, what are the words in that dialogue, if you like? And if we can understand enough about how that works, can we stop it and thereby um, stop the, the, the cost to global agriculture and thereby um, uh, ensure uh, food security? So what do we know about how this works? Um, we know that the nematode um, has a series of effector molecules, uh, and these are often proteins that the nematode will deliver into the plant in order to manipulate the plant uh, to its benefit. So here on the left, you can see this uh, schematic uh, diagram of a typical plant parasitic nematode. Uh, and on the right, you can see this video of a, of a nematode trying to enter the root initially, and here now um, kind of burrowing within the root, if you can see that there. So um, at the head end of the nematode is this, um, what's called a stylet. This is this needle-like structure that the nematode can use um, to uh, puncture plant cells and, and, and disrupt plant cells. And you can see that here. Um, and it does that by physical disruption. But this, this, this stylet is also um, hollow. It's a hollow tube. It's like a needle. And through that stylet, the nematode can deliver these effector proteins. So these effectors are produced in this gland and you can see that labeled here. Um, and a series of these effector proteins will be produced in that gland uh, and delivered through that um, needle-like stylet uh, into the plant. Now, these effector molecules uh, can help almost every aspect of being a parasite. Um, they can help right at the early stages, for example, to enter into the plant. So these could be proteins that help soften the plant and aid in entry. Or for what I'm more interested in are the ones that um, the nematode injects directly into uh, the single cells in, in the middle of the of the root uh, and that um, convince that root cell to start dividing and to form that feeding site. And so um, clearly effectors are the key, right? So if it's these effectors that permit the nematode um, to get into the plant and, and, and allow the nematode to communicate um, um, on this molecular level uh, with the plant and convince it to make this new, uh, new feeding site, then clearly um, you know, if we want to stop this interaction, then we want to stop the effectors, right? We want to stop their function. So what's that got to do with um, this picture? Um, well, I like this as a way to kind of conceptualize the problem. So I like to think of parasitism as um, being this very carefully orchestrated process. Um, it's, um, there are many uh, independent parts. Um, and so you can imagine each one of these independent instruments as being an effector. There are literally hundreds of effectors. Each one carries out um, a subset of tasks or, 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 or um, a slightly different tasks from the next. Uh, and really, it's the concerted action of all of the effectors that gives rise to this magnificent uh, masterpiece or this amazing phenotype of, of, of altering plant um, 
development and physiology and things like that. And so, you know, if you think of this from a first principles approach, if we want to say, okay, well, which ones of these effectors should we try to block? Should we try to understand and we want to stop? Uh, then you can pose this open question and say, okay, so in an orchestra, what would we want to do? If we wanted to disrupt this in the simplest uh, and most efficient way possible, which which one would we, which, which um, person would we go after? And you might think, okay, um, let's steer away from anything quiet. So the triangle, let's not let's not go after that. Uh, maybe we want to go for the loudest. So let's go for the drums. Or maybe we want to go for, you know, something that contributes a lot to uh, apparently to this overall um, phenotype. Or maybe we want to go for the biggest instrument, or the most uh, most obvious. So let's say the most obvious group, the most common group. So let's go for strings. We want to go for strings. Um, and so we thought about this, uh, and we thought um, that actually the, the the best place to start would be to go to the um, to try to block the person who makes no noise, so to block the, the conductor. So the conductor here doesn't make any sound, um, but they're responsible for the concerted action of a number of independent parts um, within this complex system. And so without the construct, uh, conductor, then this whole orchestra is going to really struggle to get going and, and it's not going to be uh, organized properly. Um, we reason that there must be some way the nematode knows which genes or which of its genes it's going to use as effectors. So it's got to have some way to say, okay, these are my effectors. I'm going to use these to manipulate the plant. Uh, I'm going to put these in my gland cell, if you like, express them in my gland cell and deliver those into the plant. And these other genes, I'm not going to do that, for example. So it must have some way to do that. And so if we can find that way, that mechanism, uh, that orchestrator or, or kind of conductor, um, and we block its function, then at the same time, we should be able to block the function of um, all of the uh, effectors that it regulates. Uh, and in so doing, we expect that should have an effect at least as good as the combined effect of removing all of the uh, individual effectors by themselves. And so this is really what we try and do in the lab. We try to identify uh, the effectors, first of all, start there. Uh, identify how they work, what do they do, identify the groups of effectors that are kind of um, orchestrated or regulated in the same way, and try to pin down what that regulator might be, what that conductor um, might be, and then stop the conductor uh, and, and see what happens to the effectors. And so uh, the way we do this is by making um, uh, various transgenic plants. Here you can see potatoes uh, that we made in the lab that were designed to um, disrupt um, one of these um, candidate conductors. And the idea is we use these as a tool um, to simply tell us whether or not um, this gene that we're targeting is the right gene, uh, is indeed the conductor, and whether or not it would be a good target to um, to use against nematode control. Uh, and this gives you a kind of um, uh, idea of what this looks like, you know, in practice. I mean, these are just potatoes that you would you could find in your cupboard if you left them a bit too long in the dark. Um, and so we set these up for a nematode resistant trial to try to understand you know, whether or not we can make these um, resistant to this pathogen. So that kind of gives you an idea. You know, we start all the way from genes, trying to understand how individual genes work, um, you know, how do they how do they function, how are they regulated, uh, and then we go try and go use that knowledge to go all the way through to a, a whole potato plant um, to resistant plants. So with that, I just want to thank you for your attention if you're still here. Um, I want to thank uh, my lab. They have give us a great time every day discussing science and coming up with um, uh, new ideas and solving problems. And it's just fantastic. I have to thank my funding bodies, um, BBSRC, um, Welcome, uh, the Marie Curie Action, EMBO, the Rank Prize Funds, and Carnegie Trust um, for kind of funding the lab as a whole uh, and the research we do in particular. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk.